So let's get into the Word this morning. We want to equip ourselves in the Word so that we can be a blessing to other people and a blessing to God. Amen. We've been away from the study of beholding your order for a little while from Colossians 2.5. Paul said that he was absent in body but present in spirit, joining and beholding their order and the steadfastness of their faith. And what we have been looking at in this series for <clears throat> some time now is uh, a passage in 1 Corinthians 14, uh, the so-called woman passage there, and we're going to return there this morning. We've been looking at some erroneous interpretations. I'm just going to review this for a moment because we're going to come to a new category of erroneous interpretations. And I hope I can get through with this this morning, and then we'll be prepared for what Paul meant by what Paul said. And you may be a little surprised. I don't know if you've come to all of your own conclusions in your own mind what Paul means. Verses 34 and 35, Let your women keep silence in the assemblies, for it's not permitted un unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. I don't know if you've come to your own conclusion on that. Uh, maybe it'd be best if you haven't totally come to it to wait so you can hear what other people's conclusions are and you can either choose to accept them or reject them. We have covered five, five interpretations so far, but we place them all under one category. If you have your notes from last time, I don't know how all of you do. I have different folders that, you know, keep all the different notes for different classes, or I would get in here with the photo for theology I'm supposed to be in, um, I don't know what. Those that misread the relationship between chapters 11 and 14. If you read any writings, any commentaries on 1 Corinthians 14, they'll say, now, well, well, obviously, this is either in direct contradiction to chapter 11, or it appears to be in direct contradiction to chapter 11. And so the first thing, and this is true, I've said it myself before, the first thing that you're going to have to do has come to an understanding of the relationship of those two chapters. So the first category of interpretations would be those interpretations that misread the relationship between chapters 11 and 14 by giving the precedence to chapter 14. In other words, these are those interpretations that go too far in one direction, and that direction is they silence women completely. Where do you get that? Well, you don't get that from chapter 11. There it seems as though Paul is saying you pray and prophesy in church. So you get that from chapter 14. And once you get that, then you go back and reinterpret chapter 11. In other words, chapter 14 is read as though it came first, and it really doesn't. I mean, if someone wrote you a letter and you, and you just kind of skipped the middle and read the end, and then you could force the middle to get into line with the end, then maybe what you should do is read it consecutively. I realize Paul didn't write in chapters, but um, Paul didn't write everything at the same time either. What The content of chapter 11 precedes the content of chapter 14. Now, so what were some of those interpretations? Let me just mention them real quickly again. Um, those, I said, we've covered about five that misread the relationship. And all of these go too far in one direction. I would say, I guess, too far to the right. Right's always conservative and left is liberal. We know that Paul's going to put some type of restriction on women. So if you're trying to restrict w women, at least you're trying to be semi-conservative. So these go too far to the right. Or that's your right, my left hand, too far to the right. Here those are. Number one, we, we are told that there's simply a contradiction in the Apostle Paul's writings and there's nothing we can do about it. But we didn't really spend much time there. Secondly, what Paul had earlier given with his right hand, he now takes back with his left hand. <laughs> This is, and I just read this again the other day in, in another commentary where the man said that, or maybe it was a woman writing it, I can't remember now, but they said that Paul on further reflection and mature judgment. I mean, he really matured a lot, I guess. He had to mature in a hurry because by the time he got to chapter 14, he already had to change his mind on chapter 11. So on further reflection or mature judgment, what the apostle Paul had earlier granted, he now takes back because when he starts writing, the contents of chapter 14, he has brought to his mind so vividly the fact that there's so much disorder among the women in the Corinthian church, so this theory goes, that he must outlaw them speaking completely. Then a third view was, and this is the most ingenious new theory, 
is that uh, these two verses in chapter 14 are a gloss, they're an interpolation. They were not written by the hand of Paul. They're non-authentic. They're written by a later scribe, a later scribe, and I guess the same scribe who wrote that also was happy, happened to be copying 1 Timothy 2 and wrote those two verses in. <laughs> what we're often told is that the scribe that was the copying 1 Corinthians 14 knew of 1 Timothy 2, and he wanted to put something in 1 Corinthians 14 that would line this epistle up with one of Paul's other epistles. It'd make better sense just to mark out what you don't like over in uh, 1 Timothy 2. Now, I didn't tell you this, maybe, last time when we were looking at this. I, I did give you, from a commentary, a new, well-known, very powerful, popular commentary, big 800-page, thick, hardback one, that this is a new, ingenious theory. That you, I mean, that, that's a real easy way to deal with it, isn't it? That's kind of like, that's how the liberals deal with anything they don't like. You just take it out of the Bible, say it's not inspired. I mean, that is, that's the way the liberals deal with whatever it is they don't like. What do the Jehovah's Witnesses do with, you know, John 1.1? 1, 1? Well, in the beginning was a word, and, you know, a word was with God, and he was, you know, a God, not the God, small g. You just take out whatever you don't like there and put something else in. But from my reading of the Bible, that's not the way we play this game. <laughs> the way you play this game is you find out if it's written and you don't tamper with it then. As we entitled one of the earlier messages in Revelation, warning. There's a warning on the label, handle with care. Amen. There's a warning on the label of Revelation, you know, in the last couple of verses there in chapter 22, handle with care. And that could more or less be said for the whole word of God. There is a warning on the label, handle with care. It's not our book, it's God's book. So I've never been instructed in my Christianity that that is really the way how we play this Christian game. The way you play the game is you play by the rules. Amen. And this is final, the final word of the great king. Maybe what I didn't tell you last time is that some um, manuscripts have verses 34 and 35 after verse 40. All right? They're at the end of the chapter. The Western family of manuscripts, by the way, that's a certain textual family, Caesarean and all of that, Byzantine. The Western family of manuscripts has the 34th and the 35th verse at the end of the chapter uh, instead of where we find it in our Bible. And so some scholars, this man I quoted to you from last time, uh, among them, some scholars have hypothesized, well, I guess the fact that we see a verse in several different locations probably indicates to us that it's not authentic. Well, I don't know if you'll remember this, but in New Testament introduction, we gave you a rather long study on those last couple of chapters in the book of Romans, Romans 15 and 16. Because you think that a book's going to end with a doxology and a blessing on the people, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Paul only ends with that about four times. And you've got all different types of theories as to what truly is the end of the book of Romans. Um, if you don't remember, we're close enough to Romans, aren't we? So jump back over to Romans chapter uh, 15. Romans 15, 33. Some people say that chapter 16 is just a non-authentic spurious addition to the canonical book of Romans. And that's because it looks like chapter 15 is the end. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. That sounds like a good end to a letter. Then he starts into another chapter I commended to you, Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church of Sincrea. You read along for a while and uh, come down to verse uh, 20. The God of peace shall bruise Satan. Literally, the Greek is crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. So the end of the book, right? Well, no. <laughs> we go on to some more verses. Then verse 24. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. End of the book? No. I said four times he does it. Verse 27. To God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. And finally that's him. Well, surely you can see how the liberals see all those and say, well now, which one of these is the true, authentic conclusion in the book of Romans? And how can you say 1627 is when three times earlier Paul has said, so they rearrange the whole thing and end up taking most of, if not all of, chapter 16 out of the book of Romans. That's the liberal tendency. I don't believe the scholar I quoted to you from last time believes that or has done that with the book of Romans. But because he comes from a Pentecostal background and persuasion that has allowed women too much freedom in the church to be evangelists and prophetesses and preachers and teachers and pastors and foreign missionaries and all of this, then strangely enough, because 
one family of Western manuscripts, not even the most reliable family, by the way, has verses 34 and 35 at the end of the chapter. Well, moving along, that was the third view. A fourth one is the concessionist theory. Paul makes a concession for women who can't control themselves in chapter 11, but his true doctrine is found in 1434. And then finally was the privacy view, or the home prayer meeting view. <clears throat> and this is really popular with um, numerous commentators. I am just surprised at how many well-known commentators follow this theory. It has some semblance of um, respectability to it because they're trying to not have Paul contradict himself. So they say in chapter 14, he's talking about speaking in the assembly. Women may not, anything, whether it's prophecy, prayer, pray, they can't do anything in the assembly. Chapter 11 is a private home meeting. In a private home meeting, there women may pray, prophesy, as long as they wear the external visible sign of submission, the head covering. <clears throat> now, I will just go right on into this morning, and I'm going to do that here real quickly in just a moment anyway, but since on Friday night we were talking about, in systematic theology, the Princetonians, we looked at the four important leaders, Archibald Alexander, Charles Hodge, A.A. A. Hodge, Benjamin Warfield. Uh, I, I looked up some of their views, and I just thought I would refer to this, that that was a Princetonian view. And it's just a common, common view, not so much maybe among a lot of lay people, but because generally the lay people go too far in, in, to the left, too far in the liberal direction. The commentators go too far in the other direction, trying to give precedence to chapter 14 over chapter 11. But for instance, B.B. Warfield, writing in an official organ of the Presbyterian Church of which he was a part, did an article in October of 1919 entitled, Women Speaking in the Church. This was published in the Presbyterian, which was an official publishing organ of his denomination. In October of 1919, did an article entitled, Women Speaking in the Church, and what view did he come out on with? This one right here, the view that we're on. That chapter 14 is public and chapter 11 is private. Or I think I brought and showed you Hodge's commentary on 1 Corinthians, Charles Hodge, earlier than Warfield. Maybe Warfield got his view from Hodge. Listen to what Hodge says about this passage. The speaking intended, he's talking about chapter 14, is public speaking, and especially in the church. In the Old Testament, it had been predicted that your sons and daughters shall prophesy a prediction which the Apostle Peter quotes as verified on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2.17. And in Acts 21.9, mention is made of four daughters of Philip who prophesied. Now listen to this next sentence or two. The Apostle himself seems to take for granted in 11.5, 5 Corinthians 11.5, he seems to take for granted that women might receive and exercise the gift of prophecy. It is therefore only the public exercise of the gift that is prohibited. That is over in chapter 14. So there's that view. It's a privacy view. You can do it in private, chapter 11, but you can't do it in public, chapter 14. We gave responses to that, and we're going to repeat some of those responses when we get into something here in a moment. Now, basically, uh, what we end up with in this category is that the silence enjoined by the Apostle Paul is absolute. I mean, regardless of which one of these views under this first category one, inter one takes, which one of these interpretations one abides by, the silence enjoined is absolute. Women must be silent in the church. Now, as I pointed out before, and I want to point out a little more officially and formally now, if you're taking notes here, no one really believes this, all right? I'm going to show you that. No one really believes this. Those who hold this position really don't believe it. What they're trying to do is enjoin silence. You see, if you look at chapter 14 and verse 34, let your women keep silence in the churches. So what would that mean? Except, I guess, keep silence in the churches. So how can you prophesy and be silent? See, this is, they try to get you. This is the rationale they follow. And it's good logic. It's good logic, and sometimes logic is good. Well, logic, if it's scriptural, is always good. God's word is going to be consistent with itself. And that's what we're arguing. It's going to be consistent with itself. Amen. But you're going to have to take verse 34 in the context of the whole revelation. So you say, well, that's what we've been trying to do. 
And so we saw that women can prophesy, and here they can't talk in the church. So we're trying to take the context of the whole revelation, but you still end up with an unscriptural view. They can prophesy in private, but not in public. But they're saying that this is what it said, let your women keep silence in the church. So what you've done, you, you understand, Paul, the silence that the apostle enjoins on the Corinthian women as being an absolute silence. Regardless of which of these views under this category one takes, you envision the the prohibition as being an absolute prohibition of any speaking of women in the church publicly. Let's, let's forget about the wrong about dividing between public and public. Let's stay with their view that women may not speak in the church. And we say, give us chapter and verse for that. And they say, all right, 1 Corinthians 14, 34, let your women keep silent in the churches. And they look at us and say, what are you going to do about that? Let your women keep silence in the churches. And we say, what are you going to do about that? They say, we believe it. I say, no, you don't. Women can prophesy in the church? They say, no. They can pray? No, they, they can't do that. So you believe that women must be silent? In other words, do you, I'm asking this person, do you envision the fact that Paul enjoins absolute silence on them? Yes. I say, no, you don't. All right? Let me prove that to you. No one really believes this. No one that I've ever met or ever read really believes this. Now, if I find someone, all right, you're still wrong. <laughs> but no one i found who says they believe this really believes it. Those who enjoy complete silence make their own exceptions to skirt the rule against talking. Skirt, you know what a skirt is? Something round. Skirt means you go around. You, you make a law and you find a way to get around and get on the other side of it and get what other people are doing anyway. You say they're wrong, you say you're right, and then you do what they're doing. And you don't follow your own teaching. Now this may sound real elementary to you, but let me tell you this. Those egalitarians, egalitarians are ones who say that women are allowed to do whatever men are allowed to do. One of their, you know, they go too far to the liberal side, too far in one direction to the left, and allow women to do too many things. And those who go too far to the left, you know what, what one of their chief arguments is against those who really try to, you know, make a use of 1 Corinthians 14, 34, and 35? They say, well, those of you guys who say, you know, let your women keep silence in church, you don't practice it yourself. Those of you who enjoy absolute silence, you don't practice it yourself. You skirt the issue, you get around it, and make all types of exceptions or allowances. Let me just give you a short list. I've done this informally before, but let me give you it more formally. Here's a list of ways by which they get around. Number one, I've never seen the fact that when women come in the church doors that fellowship is outlawed. I mean, once you get in the church, you should be silent. If the church, let's say it's when the body gathers together, so for all official, for all practical purposes, we could make it the building. We know the church in the building, but whenever the church gathers together, generally speaking, we're in a building. So when you come in the building, fellowship is outlawed. Fellowship is outlawed. Women keep silence in the church. You say, now wait a minute, he doesn't mean, well, how do you know he doesn't mean that? You just enjoyed absolute silence. See, everybody, everybody who ever comes to this, to this passage, they know that the silence and joy is not absolute. Every single person who approaches this knows they make their own exceptions. What's going to make the difference at the end of the day, brothers and sisters, is whether or not your exceptions are scriptural exceptions. Secondly, that would outlaw the mother's correction of the children. How would you like to be in church with children and not be able to talk. You just use sign language or just frown real seriously. That means be quiet. You couldn't even go to the back room. That's still the church. And you just look and just start mimicking and do all these faces. And, and you know, you probably cause more disturbance and confusion in the house of peace than if you just said, be quiet. Well, I can't get my child to eat, so let's see. I, I can't talk, I can't say eat, so I'm going to stand on my head over in the corner and do a real funny thing. Maybe they just open their mouth and my friend can shovel the food down there. You're going to cause more disturbance in the house of God than if you just said, eat, or you're going to get worn out, little Johnny, Billy, Susie. <laughs> Thirdly, public singing. You couldn't sing in church, could you? How can you sing and be silent? Tell me how you can do that. But well, there's no public singing in church, right? If you believe 1 Corinthians 14, 34, according to your own theory, that the Silence and join is absolute. See, as soon as we try to bind them with that, they say, well, now, wait a minute, I didn't mean, <laughs> I didn't mean it was absolute. Uh, well, why hold that theory then? You make your own exceptions to your theory. No one believes that women have to be absolutely silent in church. That's ridiculous. That's absurd. No one really believes that. 
And people who, you know, let women do too much point out the inconsistency of people who allegedly hold to this view that women must be silent. Now, I know just by pointing out inconsistency, you haven't proven, you haven't demonstrated your opponent's view is false. Uh, but you've said something about your opponents that we should be consistent in our beliefs, whatever they are. And no one's consistent with this extreme view of women being silent in church. It's a public scene. Now, I've never been in a church, you know, where they just outlaw women talking, fellowshipping, correcting children, public singing. Even if you went in a group where they so-called practice 1 Corinthians 14.34, no one does. These commentators, I'm sure Charles Hodge, he had a wife, he had a son, remember, so I guess he did have a wife. Charles Hodge was in church with his wife. I'm sure his wife, you know, chatted to other women there in the church building. She probably corrected AA whenever he was a boy. And, and she probably sang also. Fourthly, how about this? And women are known for this in church, whether it's good or bad is another matter, but how about those big old Ella Fitzgerald solos that are sung? <laughs> solos. Well, men could sing solos, uh, big, deep voices, you know, but none of that pretty angelic singing. That has to come from women. Most, mostly, I guess. <laughs> I remember in our Presbyterian church, we had a, well, every church, most churches, we, we don't in this church, but we had a big choir, a lot of dead heads up there, who serving in the choir trying to show off. They weren't spiritual, they were as spiritual as a bullfrog. We had one big, huge man up there, and what a baritone voice he had. And, and they let him sing a solo every now and then. And he was about the only one, I guess, that could sing among the men up there, singing by himself. If, if you can't sing by yourself, you can't sing, obviously. So he was the only one they'd let sing a solo, but there were several women. They sang all of the time. You know, it was their little number. The, the key was punched on the big $50,000 pipe organ, and they came out and just lifted up their voice and began to sing. Well, it's outlawed according to this view. Number five, announcements made by women. I'm just thinking of various things where you see women talking in church all the time. Now, you haven't been to a Baptist or whatever church if you don't know that women stand up and say, now, I want, my name is Mrs. Smith, and I want to tell everybody, blah, 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 and she'll talk a half hour of all the picnics and potlucks and get-togethers and who know what that they're doing, making all the announcements. Or in the sixth place, Sunday school teaching of adult classes. That's all right if you teach the children, I guess. Well, no, that wouldn't even be all right. I mean, what am I talking about? You've got to be silent in church. But how about, and this is allowed, and this is one of the great inconsistencies that women, you know, they're supposed to be quiet and not usurp the authority of a man, and they allow women, the very churches that hold to that theory, allow women to teach adult Sunday school classes, which are made up at least partially of men. We had adult Sunday school classes. The, the major one was called the Berean class. They named that, tried to be real scriptural from Acts 17, you know. The Bereans, this was the adult Sunday school class. It was taught by men and women. They took turns, and it was made up of men and women. Now, you want to know something unscriptural. That's unscriptural according to 1 Timothy, or 1 Timothy chapter 2. Women may not teach men. Besides that, Sunday school is unscriptural. So you started off wrong. That's why you ended up wrong. The seventh place, and oh, here's another one where they really find some inconsistency. How about religious instruction in Christian colleges? They say, well, that's not church. Well, I, for most people, that's about as close as you'll get to church. Religious instruction in Christian colleges. Now, Christian colleges, that, that's a, you have a problem there on your hands, I guess, with that in itself. But don't you have female teachers and professors of men? I mean, they might be 19, 20, 21-year-old men, but they're grown men, though. Women are teaching men in the church. That is, in Christianity, in Christendom. They'd be outlawed by the Word of God. And here's one that many of the commentators do think of, number eight, women who are missionaries to foreign lands. And their argument is, well, those are heathen men. You know, like, if you're a heathen, you're not a man. <laughs> oh, boy, that's a real uh, Western chauvinistic type of condescending attitude, I think, to foreign people and foreign nations. You see, you believe that there are actually some groups where women can't teach men. That is, if you're a white man in this country, if you're civilized. But you can go overseas and teach a heathen man because he's a heathen. <laughs> because he's a heathen, he's still a man... 
made in the image of Adam, who is made in the image of God. I don't care if he's black or yellow or red or how intelligent or unintelligent. He's probably smarter about his world than you are about his world. So he's only uncivilized from your point of view. From his point of view, you're uncivilized. You couldn't even, you know, sew leaves together and make an apron out of them like he could. You couldn't do anything. You couldn't survive, you know, in the jungles without him. He might couldn't survive in New York City without you, but... So it's six, one, half a dozen. We'll divide that all even right there, then. But they're allowed to go as missionaries to foreign lands because those men are, quote, heathen. <laughs> Unquote. You know, whenever I read views like that, I kind of get righteously indignant. Like, what do you mean they're heathen? I mean, number one, they're men. They're as fully a man as any man over here. And number two, most of the men in America are heathen. So either way you go, we're still dealing with the fact that women are teaching men. And these are held, these things are done by those who hold to this view that women must be silent in church and they may not usurp the authority of the man. What about these? And sometimes it's a single woman who goes overseas as a missionary to Africa, or Bolivia, or wherever she goes. As a missionary, a single missionary to men. Well, men are involved. She's not only talking to women, ministering to or witnessing to women. So these are some uh, manifestations, I guess, of a great spirit of inconsistency among those who hold to this theory. And these points of inconsistency are always brought before us by those who let women go too far in the other direction. So what we've said thus far is that this category of interpretations goes too far in one direction. It silences women completely. Now, let me give you... a about three points or responses to that here. And we're going to finish up that and go into a new area this morning. This category of interpretations. You see, we're going to look at two big, either you let women go too far or not far enough. All right? It's either to the right or to the left. Here it's to the right, that you don't let women do enough. You enjoy complete silence upon them. Allegedly, based on 1 Corinthians 14. 34 and 35. All right, so here are a few responses and just some final thoughts and points on that. Number one, and some of this we've already said before, there's clear teaching elsewhere in the Bible in favor of certain types of public speaking for women. Obviously, there are certain types that are outlawed. Oh, Paul's not saying what he's saying. But there's clear teaching elsewhere in the Bible in favor of certain types of public speaking for women. I could say there's clear evidence right here in this chapter, but we'll say more about that and see where that is later on. Joel 2, 28 to 29, I mean, it's very clear. God said in the last days he'd pour his spirit out on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters would prophesy. In Acts uh, chapter 2 and verse 17, Peter quotes that. So it's New Testament as well. Joel said it'd be the last days, and Joel obviously wasn't living in the last days. And how about Acts 2, verses 1 to 8? The day of Pentecost was fully come. They were all with one accord in one place. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. It filled all the house where they were sitting, and there appeared in them cloven tongues like as a fire and sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they all, what, spoke in tongues, and the Spirit gave them utterance. And when this was noised abroad, you know, there were devout men, Jews, dwelling in Jerusalem from every nation under heaven. When it was noised abroad, there were 120 people there, 120 people received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and they all spoke in tongues. And it was all public, so public, that they gathered a whole audience around them. Then, of course, whenever it came time to preach, then Peter stood up with the apostles. Then the women stood up like Mary and said, Now listen, I'm Mary, the mother of God, the queen of the universe, the queen of heaven. Let me preach to you now. You would be Roman Catholics. Well, if they were, would be Roman Catholics, they would have accepted that. But the Jews wouldn't have, and the Christians wouldn't have. Women can't stand up and teach men. So when it came time to preach, the apostles stood up and preached. But we did public speaking, uttering things in tongues. And what did the people say about that? How is it that we all hear them speak in our own tongues the wonderful works of God? It was all public, and it was done by all the people. Now, that's what Acts 2, 1 day says. If you don't believe that, you don't believe the Bible. That was, that was a public word in tongues given to men, women, boys, girls, to all those Jews dwelling in Jerusalem, and it was given by the 120, by men and by women. So I'm saying there's clear evidence in the Bible that women are allowed to have some type of public utterance when men are involved, when men are in the audience. It just depends on what type of utterance we're talking about. All right, in Acts 21 and verse 9, 
Philip had four virgin daughters that prophesied. I don't think they prophesied to one another. In 1 Corinthians 11, 2 to 16, there's no begrudging concession or tone found here. It's obvious that Paul, with full approval, speaks of the women praying and prophesying in the church. Last verse there talks about the church. There is a church word in 1 Corinthians 11. So there's the first point. Secondly, and this is going to build on the first one, if some people argue that prophecy in women is private, you see, if you, if you go through all these verses, Joel 2, Acts 2, Acts 21, 1 Corinthians 11, now, now follow this for a moment here, and you, and you prove to other people women can prophesy. The Bible says that they couldn't deny that. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. All right? They couldn't deny that. So what they're going to have to do is, since they can't deny prophecy in women, that's allowed. I mean, that's commanded in the Bible. Since they can't deny that, what they're going to do is restrict prophecy and get it out of the public arena. And that was the, the home prayer meeting, the privacy view that we talked about earlier. You restrict privacy, you restrict prophecy to private manifestations, such as in the home. Now, if you'll turn over in your Bible to 1 Corinthians 14, verses 3 and 4, or let's say verses 2, 3, and 4. I've told you before, but I really want you to have this down in your note, that this understanding of prophecy violates Paul's teaching on just what prophecy really is. It violates Paul's teaching on what prophecy is. What do you mean they can prophesy at home or something, but they can't do it in church? Prophesy to yourself or to your lady friend neighbor. That violates Paul's understanding. A prophecy, and I, I know I remember in my uh, Hodge commentary on Corinthians, he says the apostle seems to take for granted in eleven five that women might receive and exercise the gift of prophecy. He's at least right there. He knows there's no begrudging concession made in chapter eleven. He he knows very clearly Paul takes for granted that women can receive and exercise the gift of prophecy. So watch what Hodge does. It is therefore only the public exercise of the gift that is prohibited. Well, here's what we're saying. There's only one type of exercise of that gift, and that's public. That's what the New Testament says in 1 Corinthians 14. See, he says women can prophesy, but not publicly. The only way that you can exercise the gift of prophecy is in public. Now, watch and see if that's not Paul's understanding. 1 Corinthians 14, 2 and following. He's going to contrast tongues and prophecy. He that speaketh in a tongue, unknown is not in the Greek, speaketh not unto men, but unto God. Now, that's a message in itself. We, whenever you're speaking in tongues, delivering a message, you're not talking to men. Unless it's that rare occasion of what? Verse 22, wherefore tongues are for sign not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. You know, the Acts 2 type thing. We're actually speaking in the language of the people there. But when you're in your own church and we know one another and we don't have foreigners and other people that can speak other languages, then verse 2 of 1 Corinthians 14 is true. He that speaketh in a tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. I don't want to get off too far on this, but I just, want, I just pause to say this much, that you have these pseudo-intellectual linguistic specialists out there who will sneak into a charismatic meeting, record tongues, record the interpretation, go back and analyze it and prove, quote-unquote, that it's a false gift. Why? Because what was said in the native tongue, the interpretation, doesn't match what was said in the tongue. Well, maybe people don't even understand. Maybe some charismatics don't even understand what tongues are. It just says that when you speak in tongues, you don't talk to men. I mean, wouldn't it be foolish to think that when you're giving a message in tongues, you're talking to any of us? You ever thought about that? You're not talking to us, you're talking to God. The interpretation is the response God gives to what you said to him in tongues. Wouldn't it be foolish to think you're talking to us in tongues? We couldn't understand a word that you're saying. Obviously, you're not talking to us. We might think that, boy, Paul has a real brilliant teaching here. Well, it's not brilliant, it's just obvious. It's common sense. If you're talking in tongues, you're not talking to us, you're talking to God. That means that the interpretation doesn't match word for word the tongue that was given. If you gave a tongue in German and someone gave the, who didn't know that language gave the interpretation and someone who knew both English and German tried to put it together, it probably wouldn't match. Well, so what's new? 1 Corinthians 14, 2 has been in the Bible all along. When you talk in tongues, you're not talking to me. It's not like 
your tongue is saying what the interpretation says that's the word back to us. Thus saith the Lord to my people, I love you. Well, how could you be saying that to us in tongues? It wouldn't make any sense at all. He that speaketh in tongues speaketh not unto men, all right? But unto God, for no man understandeth him, howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. That may be kind of a little a slightly new view on tongues for you. I don't know, but anyway, maybe different than what you've heard before. Anyway, verse 3, but he that prophesieth speaketh unto himself. No, he speaks unto men to edify, to console, and to comfort. He that speaketh in a tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. Prophecy is a public gift. What do you mean that, as Hodge says, that, oh, yes, Paul takes for granted that women can receive and exercise that gift, so he's only outlawing the public exercise of it. That's the only type of exercise there is. If you're outlawing that, you're outlawing the gift. And, of course, old Hodge was non-charismatic anyway, so if you ever prophesied in his Princeton classroom, he would have thrown you out on your ear, I'm sure. If you said, thus saith the Lord, or especially if you spoke in tongues. So if it's argued that prophecy in women is private, and that's how you explain Joel 2 and Acts 2 and so forth, we're saying that violates Paul's teaching on just what prophecy is. 1 Corinthians 14, 3 and 4. Then thirdly and finally, and uh, we're going to have to go on, I won't get too far, it doesn't look like this morning. What about, we are asked, what about the word silence in 1 Corinthians 14, 34? A third uh, concluding remark, response, whatever you want to entitle it. What about the word silence? Let your women keep silence. Now, keep silence is an old English way. We wouldn't say keep silence. We would say keep silent. It ends with a T, L-E-N-T, and not L-E-N-C-E. Well, that's okay, though. We still know what the King James translators are talking about. Let your women keep silent in the churches. Now, here, if you've ever been around some people, here's the little lay argument they will give you. The Bible says, let women keep silent in the churches. What does silent mean but silent? Silent doesn't mean you can talk, does it? Silent means silent. So that's a real literal type of, uh, of approach here or argument. What does silence mean but silence? How can you say that your women keep silence but really they're allowed to talk in certain ways and certain manifestations? What does silence mean? Silence means silence. Not necessarily. That word is used several times in the New Testament. I won't give you those. That word is used two other times right here in this little context in 1 Corinthians 14. Let's go back and look at those. Just to show you that Silence doesn't necessarily mean silence in the absolute sense as people try to make it. Going back to verse 30. And anyway, even if I couldn't show this to you, friends, right here in the context, you have to take 1 Corinthians 14 with the rest of the word. Now take it with chapter 11. And there women may pray and prophesy. So we'll go back to their argument, how can you pray and prophesy or ours? How can you pray and prophesy and be silent? Well, obviously you can't. You can't prophesy and be silent. You can't be silent and pray publicly. So that only means that the silence enjoined is not an across-the-board absolute silence. In verse 30, we read, If anything be revealed to another, he's talking about someone who's exercising the gift of prophecy, and while he's prophesying, another brother sitting by has a revelation. All right, so the first one has to do something. He's in the midst of his prophecy. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first be silent. It's the same word in the Greek. Hold his peace. It's the exact same word. Let the first be silent. All right, that's right there. He's got to be absolutely silent. But does that mean silent for the whole church, for the whole church period? For the, he can finish his prophecy or do whatever he wants to do after the person who interrupted him gets through with his interruption. Silence isn't enjoined forever and ever. It's a certain type of silence. It's be silent right now for this cause or for this purpose. It's not an absolute silence where he can't like say amen or praise God to the brother who's interrupting him and delivering a prophecy that's a revelation. You see, is that what Paul is saying? That you may not say a word. No, you mean stop your prophesying and let the other brother give his revelation. Couldn't, while the other brother is giving his revelation, the one who has to be silent, couldn't he say, Amen, praise God? Well, surely he could. 
It's a certain type of silence. It's not an absolute silence. So we find a, quote, loophole, unquote, to use their word, a loophole right in verse 30, where the same Greek word is used. And then let's move back into the 28th verse. Here we have not regulations on the gift of prophecy, but regulations on the gift of tongues. If there be no interpreter, this is for the man who speaks in a tongue, verse 27, if there be no interpreter, let him keep silent. It's the same Greek word again. Three times used right here in just the spread of a half dozen verses. Let him keep silent in the church. Now you want to read the rest of that verse? But let him speak. Well, no, wait a minute. How can you be silent and speak? It's a certain type of silence that's being enjoined. You all following along in verse 28? Those people who say silence means silence. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. I mean, if one of you were to raise your hand and want to ask a question right now, I might just say, be silent, because I want to finish my point. But I don't mean that you can't say amen as I'm finishing my point, though. Amen. It's a certain type of silence we're enjoining upon you. It's right here in the very passage. We see, we, we have little keys, little uh, glimpses that God is trying to give us to help us interpret what verses 34 and 35 mean. The, these hard-line people who, as I say, no one really is hard-line. No one believes what they say they believe. But when they come along and say, women may not speak in the church period, that's not what the Apostle Paul said. When he said, be silent, it's not permitted unto them to speak. They're commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. If they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it's a shame for women to speak in the church. It's not a shame to prophesy in church. But well, that's kind of anything in chapter 11. It's a certain type of speaking, all right, Paul's talking about. So let's look at 28 again here, and we'll go on then. I think I've made my point. If there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak. Keep silent and speak. Keep silent and speak. I would say that's kind of like the catchphrase you should remember as a woman. Keep silent and speak. <laughs> that means there are certain types of silence that uh, is enjoined absolutely upon you, and there are certain types of speakings uh, that are permitted from you. You could remember that as your little motto as a Christian charismatic sister. I'm supposed to keep silent and talk. <laughs> now, maybe some other people won't understand what you mean by your motto. Like, wow, well, say, what's well, right in the Bible? Haven't you read the Bible? Paul told tongue speakers to keep silent and speak. <laughs> See, I just, all I, you say, well, how do you come up with all your interpretation? I come up with them just by reading the Bible. You just look at it and you think, now, wait a minute, all right, now Paul said, if, now if he means absolute silence, it's all right, if me, it doesn't affect me anyway. So I'll go either way. If women have to be quiet, it's fine with me, I still get to talk. <laughs> so I don't care whether you get to talk or not. See, it, it doesn't hurt me at all. So, all right, since I don't care, you know, I don't have anything to lose or to gain what I believe on this matter, personally, then let's find out what Paul really meant then. If he meant absolutely no talking, yeah, I'm in favor of that. As long as the rest of the Word of God teaches that, I'm in favor of that. If the rest of the word of God's not in favor of that, then mm, that's not what Paul said. So you start reading real carefully, and you read over and over and over, and you just keep reading and keep reading, and all of a sudden it just becomes real obvious and clear to you. If there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church, and let him speak to himself and to God. Someone might say, well, he's just talking about do it in your mind. Well, I don't know how you speak in your mind, though. I don't know how you speak in tongues mentally. Speaking in tongues is an utterance gift, right? Other types of gifts, like, you know, a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge, they, they're not necessarily utterance. They come to you in the mind or in the spirit realm or whatever you want to say. Speaking in tongues is an utterance gift, though. Let him speak to himself and to God. Well, you know what he's saying, that if, if you feel like you've got an anointing or whatever to talk in tongues, and, and you're not willing to interpret what you say, and you're uh, aware of the fact there is no interpreter, no gift of interpretation in the church, then you can't talk out loud for, you know, everybody as though this is a word to them. You can still speak out loud, but do it softly. We might say, under your breath, pray to God in the Spirit just by yourself. Why? Because verse 2, you speak mysteries to God in the Spirit, and uh, verse 4, you edify yourself. You can't edify the church talking in tongues without an interpretation. We've got to have speech that's intelligible before we're benefited from that. But you can still talk in tongues. So, again, the motto is keep 
silent, and speak. Now, if you don't have any questions on all of that, we're going to come to a new category of interpretations then. All of these are the interpretations who go too far in one direction of binding and constricting women so they are not allowed to speak in church. Let's come to some other interpretations. All of these go too far in the opposite direction. They provide too much freedom for Christian women in this area of public speaking by too narrowly restricting Paul's command. Now that's the key right there. I'll say that again. They provide too much freedom for Christian women in this area of public speaking. They provide too much freedom by too narrowly restricting Paul's command. Now, what I've said thus far is this, that everybody who sees 1 Corinthians 14.34 knows that the silence is not absolute. Even those who say it is, they make some allowance there. So, in other words, whenever Paul said you must be silent, some people too narrowly restrict his command. In other words, they're saying, now, this prohibition only applies in this instance. And it's just, you know, a little small. In other words, in all of these other areas, women may speak. And sometimes the all of the other areas may be a little bit too broad. All right, let me show you on what we can call a speaking timeline. I just thought this might help explain it to you. This is a timeline. This first point over here on the far left, that represents absolute silence. Women may not speak at all. This over here is the chatterbox, the nonstop talking machine. She talks too much. That's obviously outlawed. I mean, something's being outlawed. Some type of speaking by women is being outlawed. Whatever it is, we'll get to later on. But we know that if you're over here, then you, you allow everything. And if you allow everything, you allow too much. So it depends on where you come down on this line right here. And you see some people too narrowly restricted. In other words, on this line, if this was a, a one to you know, 10 line, then way down here they say, this area right here, that's all that Paul's restricting. And he allows all of this area right here. And they'll call this area, or I'll call it by a certain name, by a certain category. Or somebody else will say, no, he's not only talking about that, but he's also talking about this. And so they restrict that much. You know, women may, this is all Paul's talking about, this area right here, but all of this area, women may talk. I mean, whether it's, you know, praying, prophesying, preaching, teaching, maybe all he's talking about down here is um, women just chattering to one another in the church and that disturbs the minister, disturbs other people listening or whatever. So that fits down here, but women can do everything else. And you've got different people that kind of back up on this line restricting Paul's command. And as you get closer back here, then obviously you're closer to the earlier category of views that we talked about. All right, so let's, let's start into some new categories, all fit under uh, this general heading They've gone too far in the opposite direction of providing too much freedom. Number one, first category, we'll call the little wifey category. <laughs> or you call it the wife or wives category. Two different views I'm going to stick under this. I won't have a lot to say about it, but different. You see, commentators read this. They, they read these passages. They don't know what, what it means. And so you just have all different types of views on well, Paul's only talking about such and such. So the little wifey view, the first part of that, tells us that Paul is only referring to married women, that is, to wives. They say that's implied in verse 35 when Paul said, if you've got a question, ask your husband. So he's not talking to unmarried women. Paul is only talking to married women. They must be quiet. Well, why must married women be quiet, but unmarried women be allowed to speak. They still really have an answer, well, haven't at all answered that. I mean, it's partially true what they're saying that Paul is talking to married women because that's the natural state of a grown Christian woman. Right? I mean, it's a natural state to be married. So when you said that, Paul's only talking to married women, you've almost said more than you really want to say because you've said he's talking to everybody. All the women, not any men and not any single girls, but, I mean, generally single, unmarried teenage girls aren't talking anyway. So there's married women out there. They got married and they got a lot of freedom and security and comfort from their husband and they went wild as a talking machine, nonstop talking machine. So they probably really uh, gone further than they, even they wanted to go. 
they're partially true that Paul is talking to married women. That's only because, I mean, do you want him to talk to unmarried women? He'd be talking to a very small minority in the, in the Corinthian church. What's the natural state of a grown woman? It's to be married. I mean, it's a natural state. If a person is celibate, divorced, widowed, or whatever, those, those form the exceptions. The natural, obvious state is the Adam and Eve, the get married and multiply and reproduce and fill up the earth and subdue it. That's the natural state of a grown Christian woman. Another view under this category, this is in uh, one charismatic writings, I just read it the other day. It's an earlier view of his, he gave it up. It's the wives of the prophets view. The wives of the prophets. He tried to take the context into consideration. And so he went back into verse 29 and saw this. Let the prophets speak, two or three, and let the other judge. And if anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. And he took that prophet as being just that, one in a fivefold ministry office, rather than exercising the simple gift of prophecy, which is another matter we'll talk about some other time. And so he understood verse 29 to be talking about the utterances given by the prophets, I mean full-fledged prophets, in the church of Corinth. And the prophets may have been giving some prophecies and their wives may have been involved in the judging or discerning of them, may not have liked what old Herman said, and that could have caused a real embarrassing situation in the church. And so what this charismatic writer tells us, Paul is talking about, is that the wives of the prophets may not question the prophecies of their husbands because that might create an embarrassing situation in the church. Well, it's commendable that someone's trying to get the context, but we, we're, we've kind of gone beyond now. Regulations on tongues and regulation on prophecy, which is where this would naturally fit. We have an intervening verse, 33, God's not the author of confusion but of peace into regulation concerning women and public speaking. So I would still ask, what have you really accomplished in inventing this? Uh, you still end up prohibiting with the first view under this category the majority of Christian women because they would be married. And with the second view under this category, you're not hardly talking about anybody because where are some prophets in the church today and where are their wives? See, that happens to be, and he's one who's just gone totally overboard in the egalitarian way, but this is a real nice, in other words, this type of restriction is one of these restrictions right here. The only women who may not talk is those who are married to a prophet. Well, who does that affect in our body? Who does that affect anywhere? Nobody. <laughs> well, God needs to raise up some prophets, and so hopefully they'll be married, some of them, so it would affect their wife. But who does that affect in the church? Nobody. So you've effectively said 1 Corinthians 14, 34, and 35 aren't in the Bible then. Right? That's what you've effectively done. Paul was only talking about women who are married to prophets. Who does that affect? This little group way down here. In other words, all of this group and all of this type of speaking is all allowed and permitted. The only type being outlawed is what we're talking about here. Well, I don't think that's right. When you read the chapter here, I don't, something, something sneaky there as far as I'm concerned. And besides, going back to the general wife view, which is that it refers to wives, and they say that, well, it's implied in verse 35 because it says, let them ask their husbands. And also in verse 34, the same Greek word for woman or for women can be translated wife or wives, which is true. Besides, you would be providing a good incentive for spiritual women to never marry them which would almost be kind of a, a, a First Timothy 4, 1 and following doctrine of a demon. I mean, spiritual women want to be used of God somehow, but you know if you get married, mm, zip, shut your mouth up. You can talk as much and as long as you want to. In other words, this is kind of an absurd theory in view here. You may talk as much and as often as you want to as long as you're unmarried. Now, if you're a spiritual woman and you want to prophesy and be used of God, what is this view a good incentive for? Celibacy becoming an old maid <laughs> because I want to prophesy and be used of God. You better not get married. Whenever you get married, zip, your mouth has to go shut then. Well, why? What is it that a, the married state brings upon where a woman has to be quiet where unmarried women can talk? They never have. No one has ever really defined or explained that. Another and a second category then, that's the little wifey category, 
Other people concentrate on the word speak. It's not permitted unto them to speak. In verse 34, they concentrate on the word speak and they try to locate a particular form of speaking <coughs> that the apostle had in mind. In other words, they don't really know what the passage is saying and so they're trying to look at it real carefully. They, they know that Paul's not enjoining absolute silence. So if it says, let your women keep silent in the churches, all right, we don't really know what that means, so we go on. It's not permitted unto them to speak. You know, there are different speaking words. Uh, you, you can speak teaching, you can speak prophesying, you can speak rebuking, exhorting, commanding, telling, encouraging. There are all types of speaking that you can do, right? With all types of motives and all types of thrusts. So what they try to say is, let's get into this word speak, and this is a particular Greek word here, and it means a particular form of speaking. Hey, if that's right, that will be really helpful to us. If this is a peculiar Greek word, and it means a certain type of speaking, like, let's say, something that comes across real authoritatively, that Paul's outlawing that, that'd be really nice for us, because that would be a, a, a key to interpretation right in the verse itself. Uh, I'll just show you something that just pops up in my mind. If you go over to 1 Peter chapter 3, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse uh, 19, <clears throat> and go back in your mind maybe several months ago whenever we talked about the spirits in prison, and when you read the commentaries on this, I never really pointed this out because, because it's not even an issue, but some people try to make an issue out of it. Verse 19 they're trying to find out, you know, who did the preaching? Is it Jesus? Is it the Holy Spirit? Was it the Spirit of Christ in Noah? Well, they say, well, I guess we could probably get a little closer to finding out who did the speaking if we could find out what was said. What, what was said? Oh, so, verse 19, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. So they look up that Greek word for preach. And some people say, well, now that word only means to make certain um, announcements or declaration. Or other people say, no, that's just, that's, that can be a general term for evangelism. Oh, so you've got a second chance type theory that will work its way in there. He went to evangelize the spirits. In other words, you come up with different meanings and they say, now this is the meaning for the word preach. The word preach in the Greek is, has broad meanings to it. You're not going to be able to build anything or base anything on that word. So, in like manner, if you go back to 1 Corinthians 14.34, the term here is laleo, L-A-L-E-O. It only appears about 300 times in the New Testament. It's one of the common words for talking or speaking. In other words, it has no particular, special, precise meaning. That would be wonderful if it did. I'm all in favor of following it if it does that it's outlawing a certain type of speaking. We know that Paul is outlawing, outlawing a certain type, but you won't get that from the word speak. Though. 1 Corinthians 14 happens to contain this word more times than any other single chapter in the whole New Testament. So they should have just thought a little deeper here. This is a common New Testament word for speak or talk, laleo, L-A-L-E-O. It occurs hundreds of times and more in this chapter of all chapters than in any other chapter in the New Testament. Now, one of the views, and I may have to finish this morning's study with this, that I'd like to fit under this, I read this in a Baptist fundamentalist commentary, is that Paul is outlawing women speaking in tongues. That's the type of speech he has in mind here. Because he didn't say, well, Paul's just talked about tongues here. You say, well, he just talked about prophecy. But we know from chapter 11 that he does allow women to prophesy. So that already takes care of that. What about tongues? That's the nearest uh, type of speech that's being addressed here in 1 Corinthians 14. Well, I think that Baptist fundamentalist, this is a guy down in Virginia, has a big church, big school, big university. You probably know J.F. are his initials. He's out, Well, I, I'm kind of suspicious of the fact that a Baptist fundamentalist is outlawing tongues because I think you'd love to find any way you could in the Bible to outlaw tongues. And if you can get women to shut up, then you've got half the church shut up in tongues. But you find another way to shut the men up. 
And his way is to say that in verse 39, the only word Paul has about tongues is, you know, a begrudging negative concession. He says, covet to prophesy in tongues. Well, let's see what to do. Well, don't forbid them. In other words, he takes the, you know, prophecy, that's all right. But tongues, all Paul can say is a begrudging negative concession that he makes. And don't forbid them. So you effectively end up outlawing tongues both for men and women, so you don't have tongues in your church. This guy hates tongues. I've heard him say that in so many words. Well, let me give a response to that in a roundabout way, and I'm going to uh, be through with the first teaching here this morning. It's no shame for women to have regulations placed on them, here by the apostle in chapter 14, because so do tongues and prophecy. Paul deals with three different things in order here. Paul has regulations on tongues. Paul has regulations on prophecy. Then Paul has regulations on women. It's not as though women are the only thing that is regulated in the Christian church. So are tongues and prophecy. And men speak in tongues and prophesy, among others. So they're regulated as well. In other words, what I'm saying is when then Paul comes to regulating women... He's not regulating them on tongues and prophecy. That's already been included in the general regulations without mention of the various sexes or genders back in uh, verses 27 and follow. See, he gave general regulations for tongues and prophecy. That applies to everybody, men and women. Then he goes on to regulate women. That only implies that the regulations he's talking about in verses 34 and 35 are not regulations concerning tongues and prophecy. Do you understand what I'm saying? He already covered that for the whole church. He said in verse 27, if anyone speak in a tongue, he already covered regulations for tongues and prophecy. When it comes to women, he's going to regulate them. It's a different type of regulation. So I'm saying the implication is women are allowed to give a message in tongues. 